Well, good evening and welcome to our commemorative Air Force webinar, Wartube, uh, Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. Uh, I'm your host, Steve Buss, and it seems only appropriate that uh, just a couple of days after Thanksgiving, we're going to talk turkey, actually more specifically the uh, TBM Avenger. We are certainly glad you can join us tonight. Remember, if you have any questions during the presentation, just type them into the chat box and we'll save them. Uh, till the end, we'll save some time at the end to get those questions answered, unless our guests tonight already answer your questions in the middle of their uh, presentation. And joining me from the CAF Rocky Mountain Wing, Kent Taylor and Bob Thompson, uh, two enthusiasts, not only of the uh, TBM, but also of the Commemorative Air Force, and especially the Rocky Mountain Wing. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, uh, Steve. I'm Kent Taylor, uh, wing leader here at the Rocky Mountain Wing, at least for another four weeks, I'm termed out. And with me is Bob Thompson, who is our operations officer and been here the longest and knows the most <laughs> and is not shy about telling you so. Yeah. So what we'd like to go through today, uh, start with a little CAF overview for the folks out there that may not be familiar with the overall commemorative Air Force. Do a little Rocky Mountain history story and talk about the Grumman TBM, which is our pride and joy. And I'll follow that with a little bit of TBM history. Uh, then our vision for going forward and a summary and time for questions and answers. So let's move on. So CAF, the Commemorative Air Force, <clears throat> uh, is about educating, inspiring, and honoring uh, the greatest generation. It was founded early on in 1957 after the war by a group of, small group of pilots who uh, started buying up war surplus airplanes, because otherwise they were just going into the scrap yards and being used for aluminum. Today, the CAF is a big national organization. Uh, got a lot of supporters out there, and about 6,000 very active folks who do all the work. Um, we keep a distributed museum of about 175 warbirds flying. And our main job is to keep the memory, spirit, and values of the greatest generation alive for current and future generations. The Rocky Mountain Wing in Grand Junction is just one of about 80 CAF units scattered across the United States. And um, that 175 airplanes sounds pretty impressive, but to put it really into perspective, the commemorative Air Force, if it was a country, would have the 25th largest Air Force in the world. We beat Spain by two airplanes. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Bob, who has been here almost from the beginning at the Rocky Mountain Wing, and let him tell you how it got started and what we've done. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, my way of introduction, I'm Bob Thompson. Uh, the CAF is 63 years old, as Ken said, founded incorporated in Texas in 1957 and so it's 63 years old today and I've been with it for 40 some years and uh, I got to know some of the original guys uh, Lefty Gardner, Lloyd Nolan, Disney, uh, Archie Dunahue, some of the guys that really put this organization together way back when when uh, when we started so it's it's expanded tremendously my experience is I came from Southern California, was flying a couple airplanes down there, had my own SNJ for 25 years, moved to Colorado 25 years ago and got involved with the TBM. And I just love that airplane and I'm sure most of you do as well. And we're gonna talk about it today. A little bit of the, some of it might be a fragmented because we'll bounce back and forth a little bit, but hopefully we'll cover all the aspects of the airplane. Um, starting back, uh, the, the wing, 
at the time it was called the Rocky Mountain Squadron. Obviously, uh, that's how it started, just 10 or 15 individuals. Uh, today, there's a, only a few of those original uh, members still left, of course, and uh, it's evolved now to where we have about a little bit short of 100 members here locally, at 80 some, I believe. And uh, it started um, in the early 80s. Some people got involved and um, they formed the unit, had the headquarters blessing, Rocky Mountain Squadron, and they started having some meetings. And pretty soon somebody says, well, you know, we really enjoy this, but we need an airplane. And so uh, they went to headquarters and uh, pleaded their case, so as to speak. And uh, lo and behold, there happened to be an airplane sitting in Mesa, Arizona. And it just happened to be a worn out turkey, also called a TBM Avenger. And so um, with proper application, it was assigned to the squadron. And in February, 1985, it was flown from Mesa, Arizona to Grand Junction, Colorado on a ferry permit. And you see that somewhat of the condition of it at the time on the on the slide that we have there. Uh, it, this it, After the flight, it entered into a five-year restoration. And so uh, all the systems were uh, rebuilt. Uh, if you'll notice, the uh, aircraft there has a uh, large canopy on it where the turret normally would be. And the, when it got here, it, it had that long turret on it. And I'll, I'll get into that reason for that a little bit later on in the discussion. But that was replaced with a turret, and it was uh, all the systems were rebuilt, and it was painted, and it then flew in the first air show in Harlingen, Texas, in 1990. And so it's been operating as a mem uh, the member of the CAF for all those years. It's been a flyer, uh, only with two exceptions. When we changed out an engine in the 90s, it was down for a year or so. And then recently, it, uh, we had a, an, an accident here that uh, caused that to uh, be out of service for a few years. But it, it's been a flyer for all these years. Now, the wing itself up here was uh, needed a home. And uh, we also, during the, as I say, we're going to bounce around a little bit. We, the TBM is the world's largest aircraft in World War II, the single engine. and. Um, we also have a 1946 J3 Cub, which is also the which is the smallest military aircraft in World War II. So we're hitting the the, the big boy and the little boy, so as to speak. The wing itself uh, it needed a home. We had now had an airplane, but we needed a home, and so we made a deal with the Grand Junction Airport. They were going to destroy, uh, tear down a building uh, with some hangars in it, and uh, the 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 original member said, well, why don't you just give that to us? And so it was disassembled and moved physically on the airport, as you see there with a, with a moving situation. And we, were, we found a home about a half a mile away from the main terminal, and it was out in the field, and the government, with their uh, grant monies, we, we poured a, about a five, five uh, it's basically about 500 by 500 foot concrete slab, and we put the hangar on that slab, and that's where it exists today. We have 4,400 square feet of hangar, uh, hangar and ramp space. 44,000, excuse me, thank you. And uh, you got another slide there that shows a picture of the uh, boat from the air. Well, this, is, this is what it looks like today. It's surrounded by about 80 other hangars. We're not in the boondocks anymore. And everything in the red box is uh, CAF ramp and hangers. We've got uh, these four hangers. We built them uh, in the 90s and sold three of them. So we own the fourth one free and clear and had a little change in our pocket. Um, there's several hangers in here. The TBM goes in on the end. And right now we've got all nine of our parking spaces leased out. So another income generator. And that's the front door. 
Now, Bob mentioned that we had a little bit of an incident in 2014, and it really wasn't a very good year for a Rocky Mountain mine. The uh, landing gear uh, collapsed uh, on a taxiway. Unfortunately, it didn't collapse landing, um, but it collapsed and did a lot of damage, obvious prop, engine, bomb bays, engine mounts, um, left, wing spar, left wing spar, yeah. So we were at that time in kind of a, uh, well, we knew we had to repair it and restore it. There was no question. Uh, so we got to December of 2016. It was two and a half years without any air show income, which is our main source of income here at uh, Rocky Mountain Wing. A $325,000 repair and restoration cost and still counting. And our membership in decline. There wasn't a lot to do in the two and a half years that it was up to lunch. So we had to make a decision at that point. Um, whether to fade away or the only other alternative was to grow. We, would, we weren't going to be able to work ourselves out of that hole um, with, uh, you know, with 50 or 60 members. It just wasn't going to be possible. So we made a, a decision that fading away wasn't an option. We had to grow uh, and keep these birds flying. So 2017 was really the turning point. The TBM came back. Uh, we made it to our first air show in almost three years, uh, Luke Air Force Base. Um, we made it to several other air shows that year. And we had you know, two and a half years of spare time during which we did a lot of research about the airplane itself and about what it did in its history and we found out that we really had a kind of a historic treasure uh, among other things um, we also had a member who really enjoyed dealing with the bureaucracy uh, and he spent about a year and a half putting together a proposal to history colorado to get on the colorado State Register of Historic Properties. And it came to fruition in early or in January of 2017, just in time to add it to the features of our airplane. Now, what made it special? Why is our particular TBM worthy of um, historic property? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, this, this is November 53503 in uh, its original colors when it was working for the Royal Canadian Navy um, after World War II. And this very airplane happened to be in uh, the Mediterranean at the time that Queen Elizabeth was crowned. And Shortly after she was crowned, she did a review of the fleet, and our TBM led the formation flyover over the uh, review of the fleet. So that was one thing. Had a couple other claims to fame in there. Uh, it was uh, in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, in fact, we're pretty sure that it was all six TBMs that they found in the Sahara Desert. There are clones, uh, but for sure it was the one that whose engine started. And then later in life, it also appeared in a couple episodes of Gold Rush. So it, it's, it's got a little bit of film history to it too. But it got better. 
in 2018, History Colorado uh, sent an application to the National Register of Historic Places. And as of November 13, 2017, it's on the National Register. And it keeps getting better. In 2019, one of our members uh, had a, uh, actually manages a World War II history site and had a lot of history about the TBM uh, and a connection to the uh, British government. And came up with an idea to do a memorial flyover during the Boulder, Colorado World War II fly-in ball, which just happened to be on the same day in June that the original flyover was. And we had all kinds of press and people. It was a great show. And after it was over, we got a mail, a uh, regular old snail mail on parchment from the Queen's personal secretary telling us that the Queen really liked what we did for her, blah, blah, blah. And how many people, or how many wings or units in the CAF have letters from Buckingham Palace? I think we may be the only one. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to Bob now and let him talk uh, about TBMs in general and then some history of what they did and why, why there's such a special airplane. Okay, uh, the picture that you see there now is actually the same aircraft as the previous time uh, flying. And you see in the background there the uh, HMS Magnificent, with which the Canadians were operating in the North Pacific, excuse me, North Atlantic, where it's cold, North Atlantic. And it flew with the Royal Canadians um, for seven years. And uh, then it went through the uh, cycle of being surveyed, but came back to the United States, went through the survey, and uh, was, uh, was a, uh, a sprayer for a while. And eventually it was donated in 1970 to the CAF, and they operated it in Harlingen, Texas for a number of years. And eventually it ended up in Mesa, Arizona. And as I said earlier, they were gonna restore it. And we inter intercepted that and brought it up here to do the restoration on it. So it's got quite a bit of history to the actual aircraft. As far as the type of aircraft, uh, one of our other famous uh, attributes is uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, who as most of you know, uh, was a Navy pilot. Uh, he joined the Navy in, uh, when he was 18 years old and went through flight training, uh, uh, steermans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was assigned to uh, a squadron in the Pacific in, when he was 19 years old. And so uh, George Bush Sr., as we call him, or 41, I guess, as a lot of people know him, actually had 58 combat missions and uh, did get shot down. Uh, he, he ditched an airplane at one point in time so, and survived. And the second occurrence he had, it was in flight, uh, got shot down over the Japanese island of Chichijima. Uh, he bailed out of the aircraft, uh, told his crewman to bail out, and the few witnesses only saw one other shoot, and so he lost both the crewmen that day. Uh, and so I said, this was, I think, on his 53rd mission. He was picked up by a submarine, and 30 days later, he was back with his squadron, flew another four or five missions for a total of 58 missions. And as we all know, uh, ended up going from seaman all the way to commander in chief of the US military. And so that's part of our history, which we, when we do air shows, we talk about quite a bit. And uh, we're very proud to have uh, the knowledge that George flew this type of airplane it makes us feel a little bit more better about our own eagle. So let me talk a little bit about the airplane now. The airplane is uh, got quite a bit of history to it. Um, in 1939, um, 
the military realized that uh, was, they needed to start anticipating maybe what was going to happen in the in the war zones. And at that time, the the uh, military, the Air, Army Air Corps at that time, their fighter was the uh, the P forty Warhawk, and the Navy was the F four F Wildcat. And there was another aircraft called the TBD Devastator, which was the TB T torpedo bomber. And there were several squadrons of the uh, Devastator, and it did not have a good reputation. So the military said, we want a better airplane. And so they put out a uh, bid for to the uh, manufacturers, uh, Grumman, Lockheed, and several other ones, and said they want a, an airplane that would do 300 miles an hour, would carry one one major torpedo, four or five hundred bomb bombs, have self sealing fuel tanks, armor protection, and uh, dorsal turret. And uh, the the uh, Grumman went together and they put this together. They were up against the bot, and the, the, the it was called a TBU one Sea Wolf. That was the, what they were bidding against. And the reason they got the uh, bid, Grumman did, is because of the wing fold system. The wing fold system on the TBM is quite unique. It takes a 54 foot wingspan down to 19 foot wingspan and uh, makes it very, very uh, compatible with the aircraft carriers. And so that, that's how they got the bid. Uh, in 1940, the first prototype flew and it, did, it, it was lost in an accident. And so the second one flew on December 15th, 1941, just a week after the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor. And so they, they nicknamed the airplane the Avenger. It took place a week afterwards. And so uh, that's how it's called a TBM Avenger. And the, the airplane come out of the factory in those days with everything that the government wanted and initially it only had a 1700 horsepower engine and it was the r2600-8 1700 horsepower didn't have enough horsepower so they upped it they, they modified the engine and it came out as an r2600-20 at 1900 horsepower and and cranks a uh, 13 foot diameter propeller prop uh, so it's it's quite a quite a powerful machine no question about it it uh, carries a 2,000 pound torpedo or four or 500 pound bombs or 20 100 pound bombs, which most people don't realize, or any configuration with depth charges or anything of that nature. So it's, it's, a, it's a machine. Now, as I said earlier, the uniqueness of the, is the wing fold system. Did, did, we, did we flip those through? Okay, there you see the wing fold system going. And the engine, as I said, was a, is a big uh, two row, uh, 2,600 cubic inches, 14 cylinders. Uh, and it's, it's a monster of a machine. It's the same size engine that's on a, a, a B-25. It's also the same engine on a SP-2C Hell Diver that we have. And so it's a very reliable engine. Uh, it's, they were built. They were built in the war era, and there was a lot of them around, and a lot of them have, have, have uh, worked. Been a very work heavy workhorse on warbirds throughout the, the warbird community, so to speak. Now, a little bit more history of the. Uh, what did you ask? Say what makes it unique. Um, this is the hinge. The hinge is diagonal across across the way there, and it has two hydraulic rams that push and pull to give it its unusual wing holding uh, ability. And it really has a high tech cockpit as well. Bob has spent a lot of time in there looking at all six instruments. <laughs> <laughs> look out the window. Um, yeah, the, the uh, most military aircraft of the era had a wing fold system where the wings would just fold up over top of the uh, fuselage. And uh, 
This wing fold system was very, very unique. The Grumman devised it. I think they also had it on the on the hell diver, not the hell diver, but the uh, Hellcat, the Grumman Hellcat. Yeah. So, so with those fifty four foot wings folded up on top, they couldn't get it. In, in yeah. The <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, that's there. Do you see a slide of? Uh, Four of the, we're number two there. I think the one in the front is the Kavanaugh Museum in uh, Addison, Texas. So then the, there's two, two or three other ones there. That was taken several years ago. So anyway, that's what other slide we got to go on that. So I go back to the specifications of the TBM a little bit. Okay, a um, little bit of, uh, I'll just briefly cover some of these things here, just, just so you have an idea of the, what this airplane is capable of. First of all, there was nearly 10,000 of these built in World War II. Uh, 2,200, uh, excuse me, um, 2,300 basically was built by Grumman, and that was called the TBF-1. Okay, after a couple of years, only 2,300 of them being built, the government wanted the Grumman to um, work on the Hellcat. And so they moved the um, manufacturing of the Grumman aircraft, TBF-1, to Grumman in Bethpage, New York. And it actually, excuse me, I'm getting my thoughts together. General Motors built the great majority of these, and F means in Navy jargon, Grumman. And so there were 10,000 of these built, roughly speaking, and uh, General Motors built the great majority of them. There is no difference in the airplane. It's the same airplane. The only things happened was just normal evolution of improvements of the airplane as it went through. Uh, by the end of the war, they were producing these TBMs at the rate of 350 a month. And they had a peak production of 400 a month in 1945, just as the war was ending. And then obviously they immediately stopped producing more of them. The aircraft operated uh, through, through within the axis of the United States, of course, uh, Great Britain, and they called it the tarpon. New Zealand operated them, the Netherlands operated them, Canada operated them, France operated them, Uruguay, and believe it or not, Japan, but of course Japan operated them at the end, after the war as any submarine uh, aircraft. Then uh, the, were, they were retired from the Navy service in 1954. And uh, then the most of them ended up as, as uh, sprayers or fire bombers or what have you. And so that's kind of why, why we ended up with the aircraft. So the specifications of it, it carries 325 gallons of fuel. It has uh, fuel burn is anywhere from 65 to 95 gallons a minute, an hour. Uh, it, the cruise is made basically at 65 gallons an hour. A gallon a minute, just figure that, that's pretty good. You, you look about the gas mileage, you, you're not gonna get it in these big engines, no question about it. Um, carries 32 gallons of oil. Max speed is 267 miles an hour. And a lot of people ask about the speeds of operating the aircraft. They're very similar to a general aviation aircraft, believe it or not. Um, it's it's uh, nothing so fantastic about it. It's uh, basically uh, uh, 110, 120 miles an hour downwind, uh, 100 mile an hour base, 90 mile an hour final, 80 mile an hour over the over the uh, over the numbers. So anybody that file, flies general aviation aircraft, the speeds aren't uh, uh, going to bother you at all, so to speak. Uh, it's 54 foot wingspan. It's 40 foot in length. It's 16 foot high to the top of the cockpit, but if the propeller is sticking straight up, it's 19 foot high. And so it's a big airplane. It weighs uh, on the ground empty. It basically is a 10,000 pound aircraft, but when we fully load the airplane and military configuration of a torpedo or an armament and um, ammunition and everything else, it's 18,000 pounds. So it's a nine ton airplane. 
And so somebody's going to say, well, how's that handle? It's a big pickup truck. There's no question about it. It's very, very strong. It's very docile. Uh, it doesn't have any bad characteristics to it at all. Uh, even though it's a tail dragger, uh, we have to remember that it, it's a it's, uh, 54 foot wingspan, but the length of it is 40 some feet. So that rudder and tail dragger thing is you don't have the uh, squirreliness that you have on a T6 or a Stearman or anything else. Visibility over the nose of it, and if it's sitting in its three-point attitude, looking out through the cockpit, you can actually see the runway in front of you. Of course, it may be 500 feet down the runway, but you can see it. Unlike a T6, where the, the, you're in the sick cockpit of a T6, the runway is totally blanked in front of you. And that's true of most World War II aircraft that were tail draggers. So it's a very docile aircraft, but it's heavy. It's heavy on the controls, especially in, uh, in roll. Uh, pitch isn't so bad, but in roll, uh, if you look at the airplane, um, it has very small ailerons. And so the faster you go, do you mean, need more effort pressure on those ailerons in order to roll the aircraft? Now, when I say roll, we don't roll this aircraft. It's not aerobatic at all. It's, a, it's pretty straightforward. It's a, a, it can do just about every normal wing over type maneuver, uh, uh, but not it's not aerobatics. They tried to see if it was aerobatic uh, capabilities, but way back when they were going to, they decided they'd be ripping the wings off of it, so they decided not to continue with that. Okay, <clears throat> coming aboard an aircraft carrier with this, it's uh, but uh, your your indicated airspeed is about sixty five. You got full flaps. The carrier's going out from underneath you at 20 some knots or what have you. So you're actually coming onto the deck about 40 to 50 miles an hour in a three point attitude. And you catch the, the carriers in World War II had nine wires on them. <coughs> One reason they had nine wires is um, to give you a lot bigger footprint in order to hit the, hit the deck and catch, catch the wire. And uh, today, the Aircraft carriers have basically four wires. They're kind of deck, so if you miss a wire, you can go around. In World War II, if you uh, didn't catch a wire, you went into a barrier on the carrier in front of you and probably lost the airplane and maybe lost a couple other airplanes. So that's kind of a little bit of history about the airplane itself and during the questions, I'm sure that we'll put a few more. So Kent, where are we at? How about the <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, this this TBM uh, came off the production line uh, at Grumman in 1945, right in, in July, if I'm mistaken. Uh, and so it did not see combat. It was assigned to a couple of VT squadrons. V means fixed wing in Navy jargon. T means torpedo. And so it was a fixed wing torpedo squadron. Uh, 1946, 1950, different, different carriers, different uh, squadrons and what have you. As I said, in 1950, it was leased to the Canadians. They operated it in the North Atlantic through 1958. And so then it was, uh, uh, during that time, of course, it flew over to Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Uh, the military put it in storage between 58 and 63. And a company, I can't recall the name of it right now, they ended up with the airplane and were using it as an aerial applicator from 1963 to 70. It became impractical, plus they also wore the airplane out. And since they just had an airplane that they really didn't want to fly anymore, they donated it to the CAF in 1970. And it flew in 1970 through 1980. Well, not, it wasn't flying all that time because it ended up in Mesa, Arizona. And as I said, it, it was assigned to us in 81. And here it has been a flyer since 1981. Okay, thank you. Oh, looking forward. Um, I have to quote Pogo from the old comic strip. Um, we know the future ain't what it used to be. So we're kind of modifying our focus, um, not away from flying, but in addition to flying. Um, 
we're focusing on raising a new generation of CAF members because like Bob and I, a lot of us aren't gonna be around much longer and we got a whole lot of information um, to the younger generation. And we do that by following this CAF mission to educate, inspire, and honor. And we educate in terms of World War II history, focusing on little things like national unity as opposed to the way the country is divided today. The values, uh, specifically service above self and the can-do spirit. You know, think about the way our, our founders here in the Rocky Mountain Wing got things done. They didn't sit around and argue about it and talk about it. They just did it. They found some hangers that were going to be uh, destroyed and said, wait a minute, we'll take them off your hands. Uh, work with the airport to get that uh, a grant to get the 44,000 square foot cement ramp built um, and you know, just do it. And of course, inspiration, uh, we deal with stories about the heroes both on the battlefront and here at home who sacrifice to save, save America. <laughs> right, to save America and in fact the world. Um, things were pretty dicey uh, toward the end of the war and it wasn't a sure thing we were gonna win. And of course, honor, we wanna keep the memory of the greatest generation alive basically forever. So along those lines, we started an educational outreach program. Actually, during the time that the TVM was down, uh, we had the uh, Rise Above truck come out to Grand Junction and touched about 700 uh, specifically Grand Junction area middle schoolers. By 2018, we expanded the Delta County and added another 900 kids. And then our last adventure in 2019 covered three counties for a total of 1,700 kids. And we're looking forward to expanding further. We weren't able to do anything this year. That every single one of our events all year long were canceled due to the pandemic. So we're looking forward to an end of that. The way we currently run our uh, youth experiences, <laughs> we've had access to a very large hangar where we could put the TVM in it uh, and another airplane or two and our link simulator. We have the only multi engine, actually a twin engine link trainer in the world. Mr. Link drew a sketch of a, a twin engine simulator early on and discussed it with the Canadian Air Force. And they started building one based on his sketch and he got pretty mad and said he was never gonna sell anything to the Canadians ever again and sued him for patent infringement and uh, decided that he was not ever gonna build a twin. So but somewhere along the line, a twin got built and we've got it. So we did that, we have a, a video loop going in our museum. We have the uh, inflatable dome theater with the rise above films in it. We give the folks, kids a chance to meet with veterans and they really enjoy that. And you know, we got a path that they follow. The TBM, of course, is the star. Uh, the kids love crawling all over it. Uh, and this is also where they have a chance to talk to the veterans. 
you know, if the weather is good, we do it outside. And inside, we give them a tour of the museum and a basic World War II overview. So we're looking forward and have a vision and it's turning into a plan. We'd like to go to a much larger modern hangar complex with room for classrooms and simulators and other good things. Uh, we've got more stuff in storage than we have in our current museum. So we obviously want to expand that, I'd like to have more planes, become a Western Colorado tourist destination and drive the Rise Above Educational Outreach to basically all of the Western Colorado school districts. The main thing we'd like is to grow our membership. So if there's anybody out there in the audience that's looking for something to do in Western Colorado, we would like to have you as a member. And last but not least, we're, going, we're planning to do this all by ending up debt-free and self-supporting, hopefully by the end of 2025. This is the one you've been waiting for. This is the last slide. And um, it's actually three commercials. You, you would be disappointed if we didn't ask for something. Like that. One, we want members. Two, we have, uh, uh, we're looking for donations and we're doing that with the 12 planes of Christmas at our, our plane is at this address. And for those of you who wonder what it's really like to fly a TBM or any other World War II aircraft, we have a combat simulator with uh, basically 120 different World War II airplanes in it, including our TBM, that one painted up in our livery. And if you want to know more about that, just mail us at rmwcaf at gmail.org. Um, or you can, for any of these things, you can call us at 970-256-0693. And of course, the Commemorative Air Force website, cleverly named commemorativeairforce.com, or excuse me, .org. Sorry. <laughs> And gentlemen, as, as you were going through the uh, presentation tonight, a couple of questions uh, came to my mind. And as host, I get to ask the questions before the audience does. So I hope, I hope they don't, don't get too upset. But with the 12 Planes of Christmas, uh, what are some of the, the major items that you're looking to take care of uh, on the airplane through this fundraiser? Well, the big one is uh, we've had an engine problem. Um, we had a master rod spacer uh, break loose and bounce around inside the crankshaft, which entailed a complete breakdown, you know, tear down and inspection. And that's been a fairly expensive proposition. Um, we're also gearing up, you know, for fundraising and membership drives and expanding our outreach program. But right now, the big one on our list is getting the TVM back in the air. Good. The engine currently, the engine currently is in Idaho at the um, uh, Anderson Aeromotive. They're doing an IRAM on it, and we expect to have it back. But of course, the bill will still be, uh, comes with it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, uh, Concurrent with that, of course, is uh, another expense that we wouldn't have had is when the propeller is off, which it had to be removed, of course, is uh, there's a very expensive AD that has to be done on that uh, propeller in order to get the airplane back in the air next summer. All right. So if you want to uh, help out the uh, TBM, the uh, address is on the screen there, uh, fundraiser.com, rmw-avenger. Uh, also, uh, throughout the presentation, there was a, a, almost a common thread with the airplane going back to Arizona. 
and uh, in 2014 is probably the, the last example of that when the uh, airplane had its uh, incident on landing. But the uh, the folks in uh, the uh, Arizona wing actually uh, helped uh, get the airplane back and going again. They certainly did. They were a great help. And the Boeing folks um, in right. and field also jumped in and helped and built parts for us. Yeah, the airplane uh, had its incident and accident at the Glendale Airport, uh, which is on the west side of uh, Phoenix. And the next day, you saw the, there with the airplane being picked up with a big crane loaded onto a, a truck. And it was trucked across Phoenix in the middle of the night uh, <laughs> on the interstate over to the uh, uh, facility there. And it spent, it spent, well, two and a half years there until we got it back. So. Yeah, it was a, an amazing uh, uh, cooperative effort between the two wings, and and I, I know for you in Colorado, as as uh, you had mentioned in your presentation, there wasn't a lot to do with the uh, without having an airplane there. But uh, so you've managed to uh, get it back in in the air, and and hopefully we'll see it uh, on the air show circuit uh, when air shows come back, hopefully in twenty twenty one. You bet. You no, know, we're right. we're waiting with bated breath, <laughs> as we all are. Um, Leah, I understand we, we may have a few uh, questions from the audience. Yes, we do have some questions, and I'm uh, henceforth I shall call this part segment of the webinar the hot seat, so get ready for these questions. <laughs> you didn't know okay. we're coming. Okay, we're ready. Right, so, <laughs> get ready. The first question is, what is the significance of the up-pointing arrow, sometimes seen on the Corsair on the aircraft's tail? Yes, uh, World War II, uh, different air groups, so as to speak, that were operating off of different carriers. The identification of the arrow is uh, to determine that airplane was assigned at that time, at least the paint scheme of that airplane, of course, was operating off the uh, Boxer. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> my mind went blank. Uh, Tell me, Kent. Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill. Now, if you look, if you see other uh, aircraft, vintage aircraft, Corsairs, uh, uh, TBMs, everything else, the, their markings will be different. There's some that have a, a set of dice on the tail. There's other ones that have uh, different kind of markings. And basically, that's identification of uh, the aircraft is being operated off of the carrier. In this case, the arrow was the Bunker Hill. So if you're keeping track, Bob gets a point. <laughs> the next question, um, can you tell us about the dorsal gun position? Did the third crewman fly down there all the time? The, the initial aircraft was produced with a 50 caliber forward and a 30 caliber stinger. After 1,600 of them, that stinger out of the back was taken out. And so the majority of the aircraft were built did not have a rear-facing stinger gun uh, under, under, the, under the rudder. But the radioman who was in the back, that was his assignment as necessary to uh, staff and operate that gun when necessary. Okay. Um, can people get rides in the aircraft? Does the does the TBM do you guys do revenue rides? Well, they certainly do. And I'll just point out while I've got this picture out that there's room for a pilot. The original crew was a pilot who sat in the pilot seat. Uh, the turret gunner who sat in the turret gun and the radio man sat down in the basement. Uh, his job was radio, radio man. He did the navigating. He, he might have had that stinger gun where he'd lay down on the floor and point it out the back. Um, and he also had uh, the ability or option to drop the torpedo. Now, We've got a back seat between the turret and the pilot seat. The seat here used to be full of great big giant radio equipment, 
um, with big vacuum tubes, generated a lot of heat, used a lot of energy, uh, and filled up that whole space. So now we have room for a pilot, a passenger here, a passenger there, and a passenger down in the basement. We call it the bilge, deep it in the Navy. Also, that center section uh, after the war, when the aircraft started to uh, operate with radar, they had a radar scope and an operator in that area too. And that, that was where you had that original picture of the uh, long, elongated uh, cockpit, so as to speak, without the turret. That basically was the configuration they had when they operated them as ASW with radar. Well, then that leads directly into the next question, which is, can you comment on the history of the canopy turret modifications? Uh, actually, the aircraft was designed with that turret. It was not a modification. They, they, they took it out. And of course, uh, it's, it's a complex operation. It's an electrical operation. And so uh, after this, when they were operating them as, as, as uh, 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 fire bombers and what have you, they, they didn't want that weight there. So they just put a different configuration on it. So when we got the airplane, it came with a long, gate, long gated uh, canopy. We then put the turret back on it, which was a job in itself, finding one and having it restored to put back in. It's functional, but it's not operational. Yeah, we don't want their fingers in the air. And I made, a comment, I made a comment, the original, when it had the 30 caliber, it basically had a, a 50 caliber in the nose, and that was in the design, and that was found impractical. So the forward facing, there's two 50 calibers, one in each wing, a 50 caliber turret, and of course the 30 caliber in the singer, but that was deleted as the, as the production went on. Okay, so you covered a little bit about the history of this aircraft. Um, someone's asking about the the wartime history of the aircraft, which it, it doesn't really have, but maybe you can speak a little bit to how, how that helped keep that aircraft able to still be flying today. Well, yeah, the fact, the fact that it wasn't shot up and it hadn't crashed three or four times, it's a lot easier to keep it flying, uh, by all means. Yeah, it, it came out literally in July after the war ended in what, March? Uh, uh, well, yeah. August of 45 was Japan, I think it was. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. this yeah. was yeah. the yeah. Western Front, yeah. 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 So we, we like the fact that it's still sturdy and strong and not full of holes. The, just to educationalize, the, the audience may know this, but at the same time, the United States in a short period of time built 330, 40,000 airplanes. And uh, at the end of the war, there was no need for most of them. And, uh, in, the, in the case of the TBM, where there was 10,000 of them built, 2,500 were lost in combat and damaged you know, crashes and have you. Then the great majority of them were just left overseas or, or pushed over the side. And uh, when the, the ones that did come back, or this one here didn't come back because it never left the state, so as to speak, then they were operated uh, as any submarine squadrons in the US Navy for up until 54. And they, they were operated as a hunter killer operation. In other words, there was two TBMs in the air at one time. One had the radar and the ability to locate a submarine, and the other one carried the ordnance. And that's the concept of hunter killer. And that's what the, uh, the, the Canadians were operating this aircraft in similar capacity in the North Atlantic at the same time. And so it had a use after the war, ASW. Most airplanes in World War II vintage had no use. And so they were, no, but the war's no war, so you don't need a bomber. You don't need this, you don't need that. And uh, today there's, uh, we, we estimate there's about 20, 25 TBMs in, in the world that are flyable. Of course, there's a lot more of them in museums. 
But the, 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 all the TBFs, the original 2200 of them, there's none in the United States. They're all shipped overseas or lost. And I, I personally saw a TBF in New Zealand in a museum at one time. So the attrition rate was tremendous of, of the airplane. The other airplane in, in, the, in the country today that everybody knows is the P-51 Mustang. And the reason there were so many of those is after Korea, uh, or excuse me, after the war, they were brought back to the States and used for a lot of pilot training and proficiency. And then the Korean War came and they, they used them there quite a bit. So it had a use. And then after Korea, they were good for racing. <laughs> And that's why there's some of these aircraft, there's only a few, a handful of each model or make and they it left out of 350 some thousand airplanes. Okay, so the, the last question is um, about flying the TBM Avenger and I believe there's a flight simulator that people can try out if they're interested in, in you know, virtually flying the aircraft. That is true. That's that and last slide. We'll get back to the. Oops. Went too far. Okay. Yeah, it's called the Ghost Squadron, uh, and it, it is a not just a flight simulator, but a combat simulator. Uh, you can get literally up to hundreds of, you can simulate World War II. You can get hundreds of players on their own uh, with their computers at the same time, fighting, going, you know, driving to a place to, to bomb somebody and fighting off the fighters that come after you, or you can be a fighter going after the bombers. You can fly a TVM off an aircraft carrier, go out and drop a uh, torpedo, and see how difficult that really is. When you think about it, the, the specifications for dropping a torpedo is that you have to be between 650 and 800 feet above the ocean. You had to be going exactly 160 miles an hour, plus or minus two. You had to uh, take into effect, oh, you had to drop it between 1,200 and 1,600 yards from the target. And you had to take into account the fact that the it was moving in one direction or another and that the wind is blowing somewhere. And it, it was a miracle that anybody ever hit anything. But the pilots got good at it. Well, this uh, combat simulator is, is I have, uh, obviously I've flown the TBM for 15 years and about 350 hours in it. And I've also flown the combat simulator and uh, taking it off the aircraft carrier, uh, coming back aboard the carrier, what have you, is very, very realistic. And you're actually flying the TBM. The cockpit is all TBM configuration. All the characteristics are TBM. It's, 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 been, it's fantastic. So any, any of you out there that like to play around with these type of games, so to speak, it's not a game, but it is a true simulator. Combat simulator. Yeah, you can turn it into a game. You can, yeah. You've got a body that's got the equipment to run it. You can go out and dogfight, uh, or you can dogfight against the uh, computer. It's got some artificial intelligence in, in it that actually runs uh, a fighter and a bomber. It's, it's really a piece of work. Well, good, gentlemen. Again, thank you for uh, taking time to be with us uh, today. Uh, again, if someone would like to contact you at the Rocky Mountain Wing, how's the best way to go about doing that? RNWCAF at gmail.org or 970-256-0693.
All right. And if you're a fan of the TBM and the Rocky Mountain Wing, you can support the uh, TBM, the Avenger, through the 12 Planes of Christmas. The link is there uh, with fundraiser.com, RMW-Avenger. And uh, we encourage you to support not only the Avenger, but all of the airplanes that are in the uh, CAF fleet during our 12 Planes of Christmas. Again, uh, Kent Taylor, Bob Thompson, thank you for joining us from uh, beautiful Colorado. And uh, we'll talk to you next time on uh, the CAF webinars on Wednesday nights. Have a good night. Well, thank you, Steve and Leah for putting this together. We appreciate it.